Hello and welcome back to our video series on pharmacology for health professionals. We will continue our series with chapter number four, routes of administration and the drug cycle. Uh, learning objectives for this chapter, name and describe 10 different routes of drug administration, describe the advantages and disadvantages of an oral administration of a drug, describe the differences between an intradermal, subcutaneous and intramuscular injection, define the role of plasma proteins and a blood brain barrier in the distribution of a drug. Describe how the liver metabolizes drugs. Describe how the kidneys excrete drugs. Describe how drug doses are adjusted for patients with liver or kidney disease or elderly patients or premature infants. And lastly, define the keywords and phrases for this chapter. All right, first off, a quick introduction. Uh, before final FDA approval, the drug company must state what routes of administration are the most effective and the safest for their drug. And there may be different forms of of the drug used for different routes of administration. Now, some drugs are ineffective or may seriously injure the patient if they're given through the wrong route. All right, now we'll talk about various routes of administration. Uh, once a drug is administered, it goes through the steps of the drug cycle. And some drugs are approved for various routes. So they will be manufactured in different drug forms. And every route of administration has advantages and disadvantages. So the first one we'll talk about, the topical route of administration. This is applied to the skin and the eyes or the ears. These will have a local therapeutic effect, such as eye drops, uh, ear drops. And they will sometimes extend beyond the local area, but usually not that far beyond the local area. Okay, this image we have an example of, of eye drops being administered to the patient. So the effect of these drugs would only be felt here in the eyes. That's why it's a local therapeutic effect. All right, in this table we have some examples of uh, topical administration for both the eyes and for the ears. And these are all based on Latin terms, so they may not seem as uh, straightforward when you first see them. Uh, for example, the abbreviation AD is Latin for aris dextra, which is a reference to the right ear. The word aris is a reference to ear, and dextra is Latin for to the right. The so AS would be aris sinistra, or the left ear. Then AU would be aris uh, unitis, or both ears. For the eyes, OD, oculus dexter, right eye, OS, oculus uh, sinister, left eye, and then OU, oculus unitis, means both eyes. So when prescribing eardrops or eye drops, you'll commonly see you know, these letters used. Now when administering a topical drug to a patient, remember that as you face the patient, your right hand side corresponds to the patient's left hand side. So it's always important to remember the anatomical terms that you hear, you know, superior, lateral, medial, inferior, and so on, all those are based on the anatomical position. So it's not about you as the caregiver or as the observer, it's about them as the patient. It's based on their point of view. So if the order is to give ointment in the right eye, you have to consider it's not the right-hand side of them as you are looking at them, it's the patient's right-hand side. For example, going back to this image, as she is facing him, this is her left hand and the left side of him as she is looking at him, the patient. But again, it's not about her, the caregiver or the observer, it's about him, the patient. That is his right eye. Our next route we'll talk about is the transdermal route of administration. This is a little bit different than the topical route. This is applied to the skin, but the therapeutic effect is felt uh, systemically and not at the site of administration. So this is often delivered through a patch, a transdermal patch, as a slow-released drug. And a good example of a transdermal drug would be the drug Nicoderm, which helps people uh, to stop smoking. It is applied as a patch, a transdermal patch, but it's felt uh, systemically throughout the whole person's body. This is a very slow release of nicotine, so the person doesn't feel the need to smoke cigarettes. The next route of administration we'll talk about is the oral route. This is the most commonly used and the most convenient route of administration. This can include uh, capsules or tablets or liquids, and these are absorbed in the stomach or in the small intestine. So when a drug is administered this way, it's described as being a PO, which is Latin for uh, per os, which means through the mouth. Now, even though the oral route of administration is very common and most convenient, there are some disadvantages to this route. And some medications may be difficult for a patient to swallow. Obviously, this route can't be used for patients who are unconscious, and it can't be used for patients who are vomiting. So as convenient as a route this is, this is still not perfect for everyone. Some other disadvantages of this route, 
Uh, some drugs are inactivated by your stomach acids. Uh, some drugs are metabolized too quickly by the liver. And some drugs can't be taken with uh, certain foods or certain beverages. So all these factors have to be considered when deciding what is the best route to administer a certain drug for that particular patient. All right, some other routes we'll talk about. Uh, sublingual and buccal routes of administration. Sublingual, this is where medication is placed underneath the tongue. And this provides a faster therapeutic effect compared to the oral route because it dissolves uh, very quickly and enters the bloodstream right away. A buccal route of administration is where the medication is placed in the pocket between uh, the cheek and the lower teeth. And this isn't all that common. There are only a few drugs that are administered by this route. Okay, for both of these routes of administration, uh, sublingual and buccal, the medications will slowly disintegrate and they will be absorbed quickly uh, through the uh, mucous membranes uh, within the mouth. They will enter the bloodstream you know, via the uh, larger blood vessels. Another route of administration is the intranasal route. This is where you are spraying a drug directly into the nasal cavity. This is usually done uh, topically, and there are some nasal sprays that will work uh, systemically, but this is usually done uh, topically. A good example of this would be uh, allergy medications. Another route of administration is the inhalation route. This is the inhaling of a drug that's in a gas or liquid or a powder form. And once these are inhaled, they are absorbed by the uh, air sacs in the lungs, the alveoli. See, this image is a common example of a inhalation uh, route of medication. So this person is having an asthma attack, so they're using their inhaler. So by inhaling uh, the medication that's dispensed in here, that is an inhalation route of administration. This would be absorbed directly into the air sacs within the lungs. See, another example of inhalation uh, route is a person uh, receiving uh, anesthesia in preparation for surgery. See, another route of administration is the nasogastric route. This is used for patients who cannot take oral medications. So this is administered through a nasogastric tube. A tube is inserted through the nose and then down into the esophagus and going down into the stomach. That's why it's called nasogastric. Now this route can be used for any liquid drug that can be given orally. In this image we have an example of a, a premature baby with a nasogastric tube. You can see the tubing here It'll taped down to the baby's face. It will enter the nose, go down the pharynx, into the esophagus, and then on into the stomach. Now for patients who can't take oral medications, there is another uh, potential route of administration. Those include gastrostomy and also jejunostomy. Now a gastrostomy would deliver liquid drugs directly into the stomach. Jejunostomy would deliver a liquid drug right into the jejunum, which is the second part of the small intestine. And these can deliver uh, any liquid drug that can be given orally. See, another route of administration is the vaginal route. This will be used to treat uh, vaginal infections. These can include uh, creams or ointments or suppositories. And contraceptive foams are inserted vaginally. In right, this image, we have some uh, very common examples of, of drugs that would be administered through the vaginal route, such as uh, monostat, uh, for example, which is used to treat uh, yeast infections. See, another route of administration for drugs is the intravesical route. This is used for treating pain and burning of of inflammation and the infection within the urinary bladder. Now this is delivered through a catheter that is inserted into the bladder and this can be used for delivering uh, certain chemotherapy drugs into the bladder. See, another route of administration is the rectal route. Now this is reserved for when a patient is uh, vomiting or unconscious, when they obviously couldn't swallow anything orally, or when a medication uh, can't be given by injection. Now the problem with this route, uh, systemic absorption is slow, pretty unpredictable, uh, this route is not used all that often, so this route is mainly used to treat uh, hemorrhoids or to relieve constipation. All right, another route of, is the uh, parenteral route. Now, theoretically, this can include all routes of administration other than oral, so this is really more of a, a broad term. An example of this would be uh, intradermal route of administration. This is using a syringe to inject a liquid drug into the dermis. And this is used for uh, conducting an allergy uh, scratch test or the Mantu test, which is a test for uh, tuberculosis. Here's an illustration of how that would work. A syringe here, and you are injecting this medication here into the dermis. So another example of a uh, parenteral route would be a subcutaneous route. This is often abbreviated as SQ or sub-Q or the letters sub-CU, sub-Q. This is where you use a syringe to inject a liquid drug into the subcutaneous tissue. Now in this layer, you only have a few blood vessels because it's mostly fatty tissue. Drugs that are injected this way are absorbed more slowly than they would compared to, say, the intramuscular route. And here's an illustration of how that would look. The syringe is held at a little bit higher of an angle. And you're going to go past the epidermis, past the dermis, into the subcutaneous layer here. This is also known as a 
a hypodermic injection because you're going below the dermis. Another example of a parenteral route would be an intramuscular route. This is abbreviated with the letters IM. It's where you have an injection of a liquid drug directly into the belly of a muscle. Now muscles are going to be very well supplied with blood vessels, so any drug that you administer this way will be absorbed much more quickly compared to the subcutaneous route. This route of administration better able to absorb a large amount of liquid drug. And you have to make sure that the muscle that you are injecting into is large enough so it won't uh, injure any nerve nearby. So for adults, this is why certain locations are commonly used, like the deltoid, a ventral gluteal, a dorsal gluteal, and a vastus lateral. And it's how uh, this will look. The syringe is held at a 90 degree angle. You're going straight down, past the epidermis, past the dermis, past the subcutaneous layer, directly into the muscle. And this is another example of a hypodermic injection, because you're going below the dermis. On this image, we have an example of a, a newborn receiving a vaccine. This would be an intramuscular injection. And for newborns, the only uh, suitable site for injection like this would be right here, the fleshy part of the upper leg. Another example of a parenteral route would be an intravenous route of administration, often abbreviated with the letters IV. is where you have an injection of a liquid drug directly into a vein. It's where you have a fluid that is hung from an IV pole, and then gravity helps move the fluid through the tubing. So that's one way to do this. You can also use an IV pump that can be used, and a the therapeutic effect of these drugs can be seen almost immediately. When it comes to the intravenous route of administration, there are multiple forms depending on what you need for that patient. Uh, one example of that would be an IV infusion. It's also known as an IV drip. is where you have uh, drugs that are being delivered from a large IV bag, and this is administered over several hours. And you can literally see the medication drip from the bag into the uh, container before it enters the, uh, the IV tubing to be delivered to the patient. So the drugs are literally dripping from the IV bag into the tubing. Another example would be IV piggyback. This is where you have drugs that are injected into the fluid of a small IV bag that is attached to an already existing IV line. So you have this smaller bag riding piggyback on a larger bag. So another form of an IV route of administration would be the IV push. This is where you have a whole amount of drug administered in a very short amount of time. So you're literally pushing the entire volume of the syringe all at once. Instead of, it, instead of having it infused slowly by dripping down into the tubing, you are pushing all of the medication all in one short amount of time. Okay. Another form would be a KVO, which stands for keep the vein open. This is basically having a IV line set up, but kept open for future use to administer drugs sometime in the future. This is done using the lowest possible infusion rate in order to keep that line open. So another form of a IV route would be the saline lock or heparin lock. Now this allows access to the IV line without the need for continuous infusing of fluid. Now this is a convenient way to have a patient set up if you have to administer drugs on an intermittent basis. And the way this works is there is a reservoir that holds either saline or heparin or to help keep the vein free of clots. And of those two, saline is, a, is more common than heparin. Some common equipment you would need for an IV route, of course the bag of IV fluid, uh, the connecting tubing going from the bag to the patient, a roller clamp to control the flow, and a needle or flexible catheter to the patient's vein, and also the infusion pump or help control flow of medication. See, along with the IV route of administration, there are some issues that can come up. First one, extrafasation. This is where the IV fluid is accidentally administered into the subcutaneous tissues instead of into a vein. And our next term, a vesicant. This is a term that describes a blistering agent. Now, IV drugs are known to be uh, quite irritating. It can cause blisters or tissue death if it contacts subcutaneous tissue. There's some other routes of administration. A central venous line. This is used to continuously administer intravenous fluids or drugs. And is set up by a special catheter that's tunneled through the subcutaneous tissue uh, of the upper chest. And it's positioned so where it can connect right to the superior vena cava that leads right to the heart. The endotracheal tube. This is used to administer drugs through a tube inserted into the mouth, and it goes into the trachea. That's why it's endotracheal. And this is useful if no established IV access. Then once administered through this route, the drugs are absorbed through the lung tissue, especially the alveoli, the tiny air sacs, and then it gets absorbed into the blood from there. Now there are some drugs that are recommended for delivery of this route, and they're known as NAVEL, N-A-V-E-L, collectively. And those letters stand for the five drugs that are recommended through this route. N for uh, naloxone, A for atropine, V for valium, E for epinephrine, and L for lidocaine. On this image, we have an example of an endotracheal route of administration. It's usually used for emergency situations or life-threatening situations. See some other uh, routes of administration. An implantable port. 
This is a special type of IV access. These are used to administer chemotherapy drugs. This is where you have a, a thin metal or a plastic reservoir placed in a, a subcutaneous pocket of tissue. And this reservoir is attached to a catheter that's then threaded into the superior vena cava. Okay, from there, the drugs are administered by inserting a needle through the skin that is overlying uh, the reservoir. Now there's a special type of reservoir called the Omaya Reservoir. This is placed beneath the scalp. This is used to deliver uh, chemotherapy drugs. This is an intraventricular system. So the catheter is placed within a ventricle of the brain. Intraarterial. These are used to administer chemotherapy drugs uh, directly to the area of a cancerous tumor. And the way this would work is a catheter is inserted into a main artery that brings blood uh, to the organ where the cancer is located. Uh, with this route of administration, it is connected to an infusion pump that's implanted under the skin and worn externally, usually on a belt, for example. And the pump administers doses of chemotherapy drugs at pre-programmed intervals. It's another route of administration, intraarticular. This is used to administer drugs uh, to a articulation. Articulation is another term for a joint, where two bones meet. And these are injected once every few weeks or once every few months. Intracardiac. These are only used in emergency resuscitations. This is where you have a needle inserted through the chest wall between the ribs and into one of the heart chambers. So actually going into the cardiac tissue itself. These are some other routes. Uh, intrathecal and epidural. These are used to administer drugs within the cerebrospinal fluid that surround the spinal cord. The intraperitoneal. This route is used to administer drugs or fluids into the peritoneal cavity. And here you have a catheter that's surgically implanted uh, through the abdominal wall, which leads into the peritoneal cavity. And this can be used to administer chemotherapy drugs or dialysis fluid. These some other routes, uh, using the umbilical artery or umbilical vein, accessible only in newborn infants before the umbilical cord has dried and fallen off. This is used to administer fluids and also to draw blood, and is generally not used to give drugs. All right, next we'll talk about the various steps of the drug cycle. Now, after administration, most drugs go through a very well-defined sequence of four steps before they are excreted from the body. You have absorption from the site of administration. You have the drug distribution via the circulatory system. You have its metabolism. And then finally, the excretion of the drug from the body. Now, the term uh, pharmacokinetics is a study of how drugs move through the body in the processes of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. All right, our first step, absorption. This involves the movement of drugs from the site of administration throughout the tissues and into the bloodstream. Now, for most drugs, absorption involves three steps. Disintegrate. Drugs must disintegrate before they are absorbed into the blood. Now, this step is obviously going to be omitted when they're already in a liquid form or if they're administered in an effervescent tablet. All right, then they dissolve. Then once in a liquid form, the drug will dissolve into the surrounding fluids. And finally, they are absorbed. And from the body fluids, the drug will pass through the walls of nearby capillaries and enter the circulatory system. After a topical administration of a drug, the drug form does not need to go through disintegration because it will quickly dissolve into the tissue fluids of the skin. This type of administration does not complete the final step of absorption. And this type of, of administration does not go into the blood. So the therapeutic action is only exerted locally at the site of administration, and such as ear drops or eye drops. It doesn't need to be absorbed you know, systemically. It just needs to be effective on the immediate area, on the local area. All right, after a transdermal administration, the drug will begin to be released. Because it, it is in a liquid form, it does not undergo disintegration. It will quickly dissolve into the tissue fluids of the skin, and from there it will pass through the walls of nearby capillaries to be absorbed into the blood. After oral administrations, the drug form will disintegrate, and it will dissolve either in the stomach or in the intestinal fluids. All right, from there, it will pass through the mucous membrane linings. It will pass through the walls of nearby capillaries, so it can be absorbed into the bloodstream. Now, the presence or the absence of food can influence the rate of absorption of certain drugs. Now, some drugs are not absorbed, and this drawback can be overcome by administering the drug with a different route. So even though this is a drawback, for some drugs, this could be turned into a therapeutic advantage. Some examples of that would include neomycin, metamucil, and carifate, and you wouldn't want these to be absorbed because it would lessen their strength and their effectiveness. All three of these will be much more effective if they are present in higher concentrations. After an inhalation administration, the vaporized liquid or gas does not need to uh, disintegrate, so the drug will immediately dissolve into the tissue fluids of the mucous membrane linings of the lungs. Okay, and after that, the drug will pass through the walls of nearby capillaries and will be absorbed into the blood. Some drugs like this will produce a topical effect, while others produce a systemic effect. It just depends on the individual drug. See, after a vaginal or rectal administration, the drug form will disintegrate and then release the drug topically. 
in a vaginal administration is always intended to have a topical effect. Okay, for both of these routes of administration, rectal and vaginal, the rate of absorption is rather slow, variable for rectal administration. And this is usually reserved for drugs that act uh, topically within the rectum. So these routes are usually reserved for when patients are vomiting or drugs can't be given orally or if it's not manufactured for an IV administration or an intramuscular administration. After parenteral administration, well, this would include intradermal, subcutaneous, or intramuscular injections. The drug is already in a liquid form, so the drug will quickly dissolve into the tissue fluids of the skin and pass from there onto the, into the capillaries and from there be absorbed into the blood. For IV injections, these drugs will entirely bypass the step of, of absorption since they are administered directly into a vein, so they go immediately into the bloodstream. All right, our next step will be distribution. This occurs after a drug has been absorbed into the bloodstream and the drug is then distributed via the circulatory system. Now some of the drugs will bind to circulating plasma protein. Now larger molecules will have indentations in their molecular surface and these indentations allow uh, drug molecules to bind to them. And these are essentially pharmacologically inactive as they are carried throughout the blood. Now other portions that do not bind to plasma protein, these will move through the circulatory system where they'll pass through walls of capillaries into uh, body tissues and as this portion leaves the blood some of the bound drug is released by the plasma proteins so as to maintain the equilibrium of the unbound drug in the blood. Drugs that move into body tissues come in contact with the cell membrane or exerts an effect by interacting with a receptor on the cell membrane. All right, that leads us to the blood-brain barrier. This is one area of the body that drugs are not readily uh, distributed. Now this exists between the capillary walls of the blood vessels in the brain and surrounding brain tissue, and in particular, a special type of nerve cells called astrocytes. Now, some drugs are able to pass through and can exert a therapeutic effect, and other drugs are able to pass through and can cause side effects. And there are some classes of drugs that are completely unable to get across this barrier. And sometimes the barrier actually blocks drugs that are needed to treat diseases of the brain. For example, in chemotherapy drugs. So a way to kind of work around this is to insert a wafer form of the drug that's implanted directly into the brain. Some other examples of drugs that are needed to treat the brain but can't get past this blood-brain barrier are drugs that treat uh, Parkinson's disease, such as uh, dopamine and levodopa. Another method to distribute uh, drugs throughout the body is through the placenta. It was thought that the placenta formed a barrier to the developing fetus as a way to protect it, but the placenta actually allows nearly all drugs to pass from the mother's blood supply into the fetus. So whatever drug the mother takes, the baby will be exposed to, whether it be over-the-counter or prescription. All right, after drugs are distributed through the body, they are then metabolized. And that process is also known as biotransformation. This is the process of a drug being metabolized and changed within the body. Now, a drug will gradually transform from its original active form to a less active or an, an inactive form. And this takes place in the liver. This is the primary location for metabolism. It's done by uh, liver enzymes. Now, drugs that are given orally will be absorbed through the mucous membranes of the stomach and the intestines. And from here, the blood will enter the liver through the portal vein. So blood that is returning from the intestines will actually make a, a stop at the liver first to be uh, filtered before it goes on to the heart to complete its uh, circulation. All right, first you have the what's called the first pass effect. It's the initial met metabolism by the liver. The drug must pass through the liver before entering the general circulation. Now for some drugs, most of the drug dose is immediately metabolized. And then some drugs must be given by a different route in order to be therapeutic. Because if it gets totally metabolized by the liver before it can enter the general bloodstream, what good is it doing? Now some drugs are administered in what's called a, a prodrug form. This is an inactive form. And these won't become active until they are metabolized by the liver. Now a metabolite form of a drug is active and actually exerts a therapeutic effect. But the prodrug form of a drug comes before the active drug is produced. So it's the precursor to the active form of the drug being administered. Now because the liver is the principal organ for drug metabolism, a decreased rate in drug metabolism occurs in patients with chronic liver disease, such as hepatitis or cirrhosis, or in elderly patients that have a decreased liver function due to the degenerative changes that are, go along with aging. Now these kinds of patients, the drug doses need to be reduced to compensate for the prolonged action of the drug not being metabolized correctly and also to prevent toxicity from the drug. Now premature infants have very immature livers that are unable to metabolize drugs efficiently. So the doses of their drugs need to be very carefully calculated to avoid toxicity. And the last step in our drug cycle is excretion. This is an absolutely necessary step. This will get rid of waste products. 
This step is what removes active drugs that are not metabolized by the liver. And the principal organ for drug excretion is the kidney. There are other organs that are involved with excretion you know, to some degree, such as lungs, saliva, or tears, or sweat, or even breast milk. But in general, the primary organs that deal with excretion of drugs are the kidneys. Now, a drug is not automatically excreted just because it reaches the renal artery and enters the, the kidney itself. Now, some drugs will remain bound to a protein called albumin. Now, when this happens, it can't pass through the glomerular membrane. And the glomerulus is the main filtering unit within the nephron of a kidney. So if it can't pass through this membrane, it can't be filtered. This gets returned back to the general circulation. So drugs that are, are unbound can exist by itself as a small molecule. Now once through the glomerular membrane, a further distinction is made at this point. Drugs can either be classified as water-soluble or fat-soluble. For water-soluble drugs, an unbound molecule is excreted in the urine. And these have an affinity for the water content of urine. If they're classified as being fat-soluble drugs, they are attracted to the lipid structure of the renal tubules. And these fat-soluble drugs will pass through the wall of the renal tubule and into a nearby capillary. And when this happens, these drugs will enter the bloodstream once again. They'll be metabolized by the liver into a more water-soluble form. So it takes more effort to further metabolize these kinds of drugs and eliminate them from the body. Now, when it comes to excretion of drugs, poor renal function has a major impact on this step. Poor renal function will just prolong the effect of some drugs. Because if drugs are not eliminated from the body, they're going to continue to be active until they are completely metabolized or just eliminated from the body. So people who have a renal disease or people who are elderly, this is a big concern when administering the drugs. So patients that fall under this category, you know, by having decreased renal function, must be uh, prescribed lower doses of a drug in order to prevent toxic symptoms due to the decreased rates of drug excretion. So if someone's overall health is a, is a vital factor in when you're considering the frequency of the dosage and the amount of dosage of a drug that you want to administer. If someone who's 20 years old and healthy will not get the same dosage of a drug compared to someone who's 85 and in very poor health. Their bodies couldn't process the drug the same way. All right, that brings us to the end of chapter number four in our video series on pharmacology. We will continue our course with our next video on chapter number five.